Good morning. morning. Bunch of distributed brains. How's it going today? Let's try again. How's it going today? Are you all good? Great, because I'm freaking out right now, so I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, but this event, uh, the, the theme for, for this year is actually coping with chaos. Um, when, uh, when I was submitting like, uh, my presentation, there were two options that I had. Uh, one, of, with coping, one was coping with chaos when it comes to managing a whole like, huge community, and the other one was debugging distributed system. And of course, we picked this one because it was, it was the hardest one. Um, and and I, then I had to come out with a way to cope with the chaos of creating this freaking presentation. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, it's a brand new presentation. Uh, you'll probably figure out figure that out as, as we go throughout the, through the presentation. And um, I expected it to be way more technical than it is actually. And I really hope you're you're not expecting to get like what's the TCP dump command that you should be running to figure out what the package what packages are falling or are broken in, in your system because that's not what you're actually gonna get out of this talk. Um, it is instead a talk pretty much oriented on building some sort of workflow or process uh, to actually debug distributed systems or, or do like debug sessions in general. Uh, you can apply these either on distributed systems or, or like normal random systems, um, systems that run on a single node. Um, I do hope you, you'll find it useful. And I normally don't mind if you interrupt me for questions at any time, but I think that based on the, on the setup for, for this conference, it's probably better if you just wait till the end. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks for uh, the conference for having me here. Um, it's, it's super exciting to be here. Um, and this is my first Midwest I.O., so, um, so far so good. Um, I work at Red Hat. I, I'm still there. I've been there for, for almost four years. And again, like this presentation is brand new. Uh, the content was created just for, for this conference. And if, if you like it, if, if you think it was useful, if you have some feedback, uh, please, that's my Twitter handler and that's my email address. Feel free to uh, either follow me or, or tweet it. If you don't like it, then my name is not Flavio and that is not my Twitter handler. I don't wanna know about it. Um, but either way, you can, uh, if, if you really want, you can, you can follow me. Um, or someone has to feed my ego, so I hope that's you. Um, and some, uh, some disclaimers before uh, we actually get started with the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm Italian, I'm half Italian, so I move a lot, um, and I move my hands a lot, so you might have to translate some of my hands gestures into English. And um, I also tend to speak really fast. It has nothing to do with um, either being here and this being the first presentation in, in, of this conference or anything like that. Uh, it's mostly because I'm also half Venezuelan, and and I was lucky to be to have been born in, in the most dangerous city in the world right now. And so basically, what we do there is that we do everything fast and we speak fast because that's the only way to survive. Um, and it's, if I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. I really hope you'll get it. I uh, hope you uh, you'll also uh, be able to deal with my accent and everything. Um, and and I guess um, I'm also like there's there's a small square up there. Um, that is not a joke, I'm normally quite explicit, so um, I'm sorry if I drop some F-bombs in, in the middle. Um, uh, I'll try not to, uh, but if I do, well, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so, four main topics. Uh, we have four main topics today for this presentation. I, I'm not a huge fan of actually classifying everything and having like everything broken down into very specific stuff because I, I, I believe, like I feel like that, that limits people when, and limits creativity when it comes to um, finding the best way to do stuff in, in your daily basis, in your day job. But uh, for the sake of having, you know, not, not having this presentation being be a complete chaos, I actually uh, broke, broke it down into, into four main topics. So the first one is, uh, what are we doing here? Um, and, and, and it might seem like kind of like obvious. It's like, uh, so if I'm, if I'm going to debug a distributed system or I'm going to debug an issue or anything, it's like I'm supposed to know what's going, what's going to happen. Um, well, no, it's not clear to everyone. And it's not clear in every uh, debugging session. And it's not clear uh, for uh, all, every manager and, and every person attending or trying to figure out what, a pro what the problem is in, in the uh, debugging, pro debugging process that you're part of. Um, so, if you if you seem if it seems like I'm saying a lot of like obvious things throughout the presentation, um, it is because of, like throughout the years and, and after attending um, several presentations and, and many 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 conferences in, in 
um, in my career, um, I've realized that um, sometimes it is just better to just state the obvious. And it is also because it was easier to just bring up the obvious and stating the obvious that just making random statements like many people like to do in, in presentations and assertions that don't have any empirical research or anything. So I went with the easy part and I'm just gonna state many things out here, here that might be obvious to everyone. So one of the topic is what are we doing here? The second one is high to low context. Uh, this, uh, uh, it might sound a little bit deep and philosophical for 9 a.m. in the morning, but we'll get to that. Uh, the third one is root cause analysis, because who doesn't like that? Um, that's the whole point about figuring out what's going on in your system. And then we'll bring everything home. We'll, once we know what's going on in the system and we know what has happened and we know that we just fucked it up, we'll just bring everything up and, and we'll bring it home. And that's the first F-bomb uh, right there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, four main topics again. Uh, what are we doing here? High to low context, root cause analysis, and bring it home. Uh, follow the acronyms throughout the presentation. You'll see like uh, tiny circles and the right bottom corner. Um, it would be great if you remember their meaning, but I don't think I even remember the meaning of every uh, acronym in my presentation, and that's why I have so many slides on it, uh, on acronyms and, and all that, because I'm trying to just set up the context for you and make sure that you remember that, that we have just four topics for today, and I could go on forever with this, but I won't because uh, people in the, pres in, in the conference will hate me if I do. So four main topics, keep that in mind. Let's get to it. What are we doing here? Um, like I said before, um, we, when we, okay, it worked. Um, when, we, when, when, we're st when, we, when we're coding, when we're pulled into you know, debug debugging distributed systems or, or debugging whatever issue in our company because uh, some customer is crying, there's something, on, something going on there. Um, there are many things that happen. Uh, there are many things that could go wrong. There are many things that could go right. Uh, one of the things that could go wrong is that probably you're not supposed to be there to begin with um, because you're not, uh, that's not your area of expertise or, or something like that. Um, you might be bringing a lot of people into onto the debugging session and you might not even be aware of what, uh, what issues or what you're trying to achieve there. So we're gonna go through some of the things in, in, in this topic. The first one is probably what kind of issues we're facing. Um, and again, I'm gonna break this down into probably like three uh, main uh, classifications of these issues. Um, and uh, because, I mean, it just makes it uh, easier to, to reason about them. And, and this is definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, if there are other kinds of issues that you think um, you could put into that list, it's fine, uh, whatever works best for you. But I'm gonna just break it down into three different kinds of issues. When it comes to distributed systems, you have um, misbehavior issues, like right? your system is not behaving the way you're expecting it to behave, right? Uh, you have a, a set of services that are supposed to um, to work in a certain way, and at some point you realize that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. You do a request to your system, and then you get an answer that you're not expecting to get. Um, the second um, kind of issue that you might be facing is a performance issue. So your system is not keeping up with your load, your system is not going as fast or as low, I guess, um, as you would like it to go. Um, and the third one is just random things that might happen in your system, like your node crashed. There's n for no reason your, AP your API node just went down and you don't know why. Um, that's kind of like random behavior. That there's not even a misbehavior because you're not doing anything with it. Uh, your node just like, it was working today, and as soon as you got home, it just went down, and of course you have to go back to the office. Um, one of the reasons I don't like classifying this is, again, like it limits you. It basically, you know, like puts your brain into the position of just trying to classify everything and not, it doesn't give your brain enough space to, um, to understand that it might be, that many different things might go on, but might be going on in your system. For example, uh, you, supposedly, like say you have this API node in your system, um, by the way, time here. So I work on OpenStack, and I was going to bring a, a, some, you know, a very specific example to this presentation. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to try to bring up, uh, you know, other examples, like smaller examples, and explain things as we, as we go. Uh, so I don't have to, do, um, you know, spend a lot of time explaining you OpenStack uh, because it is not fun. Um, <laughs> and, uh, what, so you say you have this API node, 
and you're trying, you're making requests to it to this API node, and you get answers that you're not expecting to get uh, for some reason. And you say like, okay, I have this, uh, I have an issue, you know, and this issue I can classify it as a misbehavioral issue. My API node is not working correctly, and then you focus just on that, but you don't realize that the reason your API node is not working properly is because I don't know your RabbitMQ node where uh, that it is, it's, you know, your API node is expecting to get messages out of your uh, RabbitMQ node, and turns out that your RabbitMQ node is not keeping up with, uh, with, with the load that you're getting in your system. So you have two issues there. You have a performance issue in your API node, I'm sorry, in, in your RabbitMQ node, the way you, are de you have deployed it or whatever, the way you're using it, but you also have a misbehavioral issue. Um, and you say, well, if, if the issue I'm having is actually a performance issue in the RabbitMQ node, I don't really have a misbehavioral issue. Well, you actually have it because your system is not able to continue working when RabbitMQ is not responding correctly. So it is not really partition tolerant. It is not, um, uh, it's not tolerant to failures in some other parts of your system. Of course, it's the whole, if, if the whole RabbitMQ cluster goes down and your system depends on that, that's a whole different issue, right? There's not much you can do there. But if you have some of, the, your, of some of your RabbitMQ nodes that are not working properly and your system cannot keep up with that or, or fall back to a working RabbitMQ node or something like that, you have two issues there. So you gotta be aware of that. You gotta keep your mind open that the fact that you can classify some of the issues that you're having and you're seeing, it doesn't mean that you don't have other issues in your system as well. So work always in a way that you'll figure out, like you'll, you'll try to make your system uh, as full tolerant as possible while debugging all the other issues that you're facing or that you're seeing in, in the system. Know what you all are expected to do there. And again, this, this sounds pretty obvious. Like if I get pulled into a debugging session, like I, I know what I've got to do there. I got to debug the whole system and try to figure out what's going on there. Which is not, it's not entirely true. As in sometimes when you get pulled into these debugging sessions, Sure, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what issues you're facing and why your system is not behaving the way you're expected it to behave. But not all the time you have to find the actual root cause analysis. And we'll, we'll get a little bit further down uh, this topic uh, um, in the third topic, actually. But you, not all the time you're expected to find the exact root cause analysis of what, go, what was going on there. Sometimes uh, you just need to bring the system up uh, in a working state. You know, like your, all your customers are having issues because your system is not working. So sometimes you, we get like locked down into trying to figure out what's going on. We want to know what's going on. We want to know why, why our software is not working properly. And we forget about, you know, the customer that depends on the system uh, that is not being able to actually use the system because it is not working properly. So sometimes what you have to do is just find the best workaround to bring the whole system back in a working state and then try to figure out the actual issues offline while your customers are still using your system, you know, like while your customers are hopefully still happy customers or eventually happy customers. Make sure that the right people are involved. I've been pulled in several times into debugging sessions where I was not really useful at all. Uh, it has happened to me several times, I, you know, and, and it's fine, like I don't want to point fingers to anyone, but Jesus, managers sometimes don't know who to pull into debugging sessions. Uh, and you know, when, when the customer calls and the manager you know, picks the call and says like, oh well, the system is down, we need someone to fix this, and they'll start calling pretty much everyone, and they'll just pull everyone in. And sometimes you're not the right person, and it is fine, just don't try to be a hero. If you get pulled into a debugging session and you have no freaking idea of what's going on there, it is better for you to just step back and let someone else do it. Um, unless you are, of course, the only one available, and in which case, well, you might want to, you know, make some extra effort and try to help your, you know, your system and your customer or whatever, your company. But as soon as someone more, um, let's say, knowledgeable comes, um, comes online or, or is available, just hand things over or be aware that there might be debugging sessions going on where you could be more useful than the people that are actually debugging the whole system. So. Try to be aware of that and try to make sure that everyone, like the, the right people are involved in the debug session. And of course, don't pull the entire company into the debugging session. Um, and this has, this has really nothing to do with the medical man month and the whole thing that, you know, like uh, adding more people is not really useful. It is true still, but really, 
if you have if 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 you have like four or five experts in and and I don't know in your API service, it doesn't mean you have to bring the five experts into a single debugging session. Just don't bring them all. Bring one or two person. You know, uh, just bring two people that are that know what's going on there and that are good working together. Because um, it is often bit better to just keep all fewer people in the debugging session that can actually talk to each other and that can that can walk through the whole uh, issue together. Um, and progressively, then bringing in five other people that have, you know, there might be experts as well, but it just adds more work into the whole process because you have to keep uh, all of them synced on what's going on, what has been done, and, and whatnot. So keep that in mind. Just bring the useful people into the debugging session and don't bring the whole uh, freaking company into it. So high to low context. Um, I was I was listening to to, to this audiobook of, um, like last month, and it was it was basically uh, so the guy tried to explain how cultures work, and and one of the interesting things that he said is that um, there are, there are high context cultures and there are low context cultures. Right? You know, there are high context cultures where people just know what's going on. You know, like they they. They can move around and they can do things without having to explicitly being told what's going on. They don't have, you know, like need many signs to know where to go, um, uh, where things are in their city and that kind of thing. So um, I'm oversimplifying this, um, trying to find, uh, trying to align with with the whole presentation. And there, there are low context cultures where uh, people kind of need these signs. They need more information from outside to actually know what's going on in this. And and while I was listening to it, I was like, well, you know what? It's actually it actually happens a lot in also in, in when when in your work environment, and it also happens a lot when you're uh, debugging distributed systems or well, not really debugging distributed systems, well debugging whatever. Um, you work with people. Some of them are part of high con high context cultures, and some of them are part of low context cultures. Um, so the the ones that are part of high context cultures, they they just know what what's going on. They 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 just know it. They don't need anything, any science or any you know extra information to know where to go and look for things. Whereas people from low context cultures, they prefer to you know have these things being written down and being explicit, so that they can they can move throughout the uh, system and you know debug the whole thing. And while I was thinking about it, I was like, well, you know, like I'm, I can I could probably just classify myself as being part of the high context culture because I, I, I just you know when when I get into zone, I just like try to go through everything myself and and not to pay attention to the things happening around me because I'm just I'm kind of like focused on that. But it turns out that keeping things in, in a low context fashion is actually more useful when it comes to debugging distributed systems because debugging distributed systems is hard and, and not keeping actual, an actual context as well of what's going on or the things that are happening in your environment just make it, makes it harder. And that's not something you want to do when you're trying to figure out what's going on in your system. So uh, one good advice, I guess, um, at least in my opinion, of course, is that you, sh you should assume you're working in a low context uh, environment. Even if you're a high context person, even if you, you're used to just know what's going on there, um, try to assume that you're working in a low context environment and make sure that things that you're doing and, and the debugging process and everything is being uh, written down and recorded so that people that are used to be in a low context environment can just jump in whenever and, and take it over if, if they really have to, or just follow along um, uh, in the process and, and the things you're doing. So and this is particularly useful for bugs that take um, a longer time to, to debug. And not, like, not all bugs take one day to debug. Like, sometimes the system might, might be crashing and it'll take you a whole week. So when, when, when you're debugging these issues, uh, you, you want to keep track of the things that are going on, and you want to keep things as, as little context as possible. And you should also don't, and, and this basically like, the previous point brings me to this one, which is just don't make assumptions about the steps that have been taken. The fact that are not, um, I mean, if the, if the steps that have been taken in the debugging process um, are documented, then cool, great. You know what has been done so far. If they are not, not make, don't make any assumption about it. Uh, unfortunately, if you cannot talk to the person that was debugging uh, the, the, the system before you, uh, you'll have to do many things twice, basically. You'll have to go through the whole process again uh, because you, you simply don't know what's going on.
and and the fact that you know the person that was before you is, is knowledgeable and, and an expert in, in the area it doesn't mean that all the steps that need to be taken uh, were actually taken um, also remember that every part of the system is guilty until proven innocent um, and this includes also third party um, you know parts of your system so like the distributed systems it, it's not just your service it is not yours it's not just the software you build uh, because you, you kind of you shouldn't at least be building everything from scratch yourself right so you have this service these API nodes and you have your database nodes and whatever um, that rely on other software and it might be a message post like uh, like RabbitMQ, or it might be a database, or it might be whatever, you know? So you have a whole bunch of third-party services running in your system that are also part of your system. And on top of that, you have these nodes, uh, you, you have your services in your system uh, being you know, run in, on, on several different nodes and servers that are also subject to, um, you know, physics laws, I guess, and uh, the whole things that uh, might happen in the world. Um, so every part of your system is actually guilty until you can check it out and, 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 and prove that it's not that a problem. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that it, it's not like you have to debug RabbitMQ every time your service doesn't get one message. Uh, what I'm saying is that keep in mind that it might actually be RabbitMQ's fault. And, Actually, I should stop mentioning RabbitMQ. I saw. <laughs> you can tell I've had several issues with RabbitMQ. <laughs> and, but yeah, like that's, uh, again, like just keep that in mind. Like the fact that you, you, you didn't write that software and that software is not part of your system doesn't mean that it is innocent, that it might be the issue. And definitely know the system's topology. Um, I, I, spent a I, I spent a huge deal of time um, understanding the topology of each one of our customers every time um, I'm pulled into a debugging session. This, might, this is, of course, not true for everyone. Like in, in our case, like Red Hat's case, we have support, and that's, that's what we give you. And, and so we do have a reference architecture and everything, so most of the customers, like many customers, should have like a very similar architecture and deployment. Uh, but of course, every customer is, is free to do whatever with their servers and, and their systems. So um, for us, it, it is important to know what's going on or how things were deployed at, at customers. And I, I spend a huge deal of time understanding this every time I'm pulled into a new customer case uh, when, when I don't know the customer. And, and I think you should as well. And in, even if you just have us, okay, even if you work at Twitter, and I would expect that like Twitter's environment that is not as it doesn't change as often as, as one as you know as as in our case, I guess. But even if you work at Twitter, you should spend a huge deal of time understanding what's the topology. Because this is exactly what will tell you where to run TCP dump when you're having network issues. Um, because you otherwise you'll end up running TCP dump, I don't know, in your API you node know, when you should be running it running it in, in your database node. Um, so just spend enough time understanding and knowing your system because that's exactly the thing you're trying to debug here. So RCA, root cause analysis. Like, I'm okay with RCA, except for the R part. Um, like, I don't believe that finding the root cause, like the base root, like the actual real cause of all the issues is the right answer every time. And an example of this is, again, I'll bring up RabbitMQ, why not? Um, <laughs> so we had, we, we, we had this issue once where, so how many of you know OpenSAC? Oh boy, uh, not many. So um, let's, let's, let's put it this way. So we have every OpenSAC service that talks to each other through RabbitMQ. Well, not RabbitMQ, through a message bus, which just 99% of the time happens to be arriving in queue. Uh, and, and we were having this issue, that, so the customer called us and said like, well, you know, like sometimes these nodes are, are, are failing and I cannot boot my virtual machines because I don't know, I just get like, I failed to reply to one of the messages. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm being part of the messaging team. 
um, I also I was looking at it. I was like, well, you know, like it was one of the older versions. Um, just hint for people using old versions. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was one of the older versions, and I was looking at it, I was like, well, it is obviously not getting any messages out of RabbitMQ. For some reason, it is failing to connect to RabbitMQ. It was like, well, but it was working correctly in the last, I don't know, like three days, and it just suddenly happened to have these issues, and then it just goes back up if I just restart the service, which is not, of course, ideal, uh, not an ideal thing to do every time. And I was like, well, well looking at it, um, I said, like, well, turns out that you know, RabbitMQ is still running, it's still doing the thing it's supposed to do, and, and the service is also running, uh, but there just happened to be an issue with the reconnection process. Uh, so at some point, the network failed. You know, like there, there has to be something in between that is happening um, and, and at random times, at random point in times, so that is making the connection between this service and RabbitMQ fail. Um, so as far as I was concerned, my issue was that the system was not able to reconnect correctly to RabbitMQ because they were both running, right? But there was this networking guy and he was like, well, you know, like, no, the issue is the network and we have to figure that out. And I was like, well, I, I don't fucking care, honestly. He's like, my problem is that this service that I'm responsible for is not reconnecting to RabbitMQ correctly, so it is not tolerant to failures, which is a huge problem when you're working on distributed systems. If the network fails, that is your problem, sir, because you're the one responsible for the network inside. And I'm not saying like I was trying to be an asshole with this guy. And it's like, oh, so I'm sorry again. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that the time I was spending on debugging this issue was limited. And I needed to figure out what was going on there in order to make the system reliable and resilient to these failures. And once I figured out what was going on, I was like, well, this issue was actually fixed in, 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 in newer versions, so we just backported some of the patches and the issues, and I was done. You know, like, do some tests, take the network down for a bit, bring it back up, see that the system reconnects, and that's it. So I thought, okay, the system is now reconnecting. I was like, if you're gonna go down this, you know, networking debugging rabbit hole, and you're free to do it, if you wanna debug the kernel, that's fine. But it's not like, it, I'm not gonna dedicate enough time to it because for me, the root cause analysis is not really important right now. I just wanna bring the whole system back to a working state and make it resilient to this kind of failure. So debugging the actual root cause of the issue is not really the answer to everything. To everything. So just try to find a cause. And if the cause is just like your system is not uh, resilient enough or, or tolerant to kind of like failures, well, just try to fix that. And, and keep in mind that a distributed system that is not tolerant to failure is not really useful at all. Um, um, yeah. So, have a list of, uh, going back to the whole uh, presentation actually, uh, have a list of steps to follow. Um, it is, I, I found useful to kind of like, it's hard when you have different environments, when you have, uh, yeah, environments that are not the same for every customer, it's hard to come up with a you know, exact list of steps that you can go through when it comes to debugging the uh, distributed system. Uh, but having a, some sort of list uh, to, to do that is actually useful. And it's like when, when, you know, like pilots, they don't get on the plane and turn it on and just take off, right? <laughs> I hope they don't. Uh, but they, they go through a, a, you know, a list of check of things that should be working before, uh, before turning the friggin' plane on. And you should probably do the same. There's, not, there's nothing bad with it. Uh, there is, it won't make you weaker. Uh, <laughs> It is actually will make you more reliable when it comes to figuring out what's going on in your system. So if there are things that you should always check before, uh, before debugging your system, before uh, putting your hands or SSH in, in, into your server, I just bring it up and write it down and, and go through it every time. And I gotta run even more now. Uh, many times the systems are just misconfigured. And again, like this makes some sound like super obvious, but it is not. Uh, and, and most of the time, like many, many times when, it comes, when, when I'm pulled into you know, debugging sessions, it turns out that the system is just misconfigured. And an example of this is, um, so the other day I got an email uh, from, from this guy. And, and it, it, for the first time, it has nothing to do with driving and queue. Uh, so I got an email from this guy. As I was saying, you know, like we're doing some load tests in, in this environment and like, Two thirds of the times it just fails with this error. And I was like, okay, so just tell me what, what your, your environment looks like. I said, well, we have three API nodes for Glance. So Glance is the image uh, service for, for, for OpenStack, um, where you, every time you, you, you 
put it, and you image into into your open stack environment, you will store it in Glance, and then you'll boot from it eventually, hopefully. Um, and so, so uh, two thirds of the time, it just fails with this error. And by looking at the error, the error was like, was pretty explicit. It was like so the node does not support these uh, specific store. Um, so Glance has support for many different stores. It has support for file systems, some object stores, S3, and all, uh, a whole bunch of other ones like Ceph. But and so the error was that like it, it does not have support for uh, for this specific store. And I was like, well, so where where did this image come from? And I was like, well, I had this instance and I created a snapshot out of it. And it turns out that Nova, when Nova created this snapshot, it it talked to one of the Glance's, Glance's API nodes that was misconfigured. And it created the, 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 the image and it stored it in a store that was not actually supported by the entire environment. So there, there was this one node, one Glance API node that was misconfigured to use the file system, while the other two nodes were using the, uh, a distributed um, store. Um, and of course, whenever you wanted to boot from that image and you talk to one of the other two nodes, they would fail to pull in up the image, uh, pulling down the image because they, they, they of course didn't have access to the file system of the other node. So many times the system has, systems are just misconfigured and taking the time to go through the configuration files and figuring out that things are set up uh, the way they're supposed to do uh, will save you some time in, 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 in these sessions. You can apply also, when it comes to debugging the, the system, you can, uh, you can do it in many different ways. One of them is just going bottom up, and it basically means that you get to know that it is a sp this is mostly useful when you when you have the failures happening always in the same node, or most of the time in the same node, like the Glance API issue that I I, I basically explained, um, which is actually useful for the next slide. So I'll just skip it there. Uh, when you have the uh, failures happen in the same node, um, you kind of like go to that node, start from there. And from there and just go from that node to the entire system and then debug the entire system. Like, so you'll spend less time the, uh, like studying the whole architecture and, and all the things going on in the system and more time in that specific node. You'll start from that specific node. Um, and again, this is useful when most of the failures are happening in that specific node. Um, but it can be misleading when, um, when of course, you, you should be doing a top to bottom debugging strategy, what should be applying this strategy. Uh, like in the, in the Glance API uh, issue that I just mentioned, where you had these failures happening in the two other nodes uh, that, that were actually correctly configured. And, and if you do, if, if I would have done like a, you know, a bottom up strategy uh, for debugging this issue, I would have started looking into those specific nodes instead of looking into the node that was actually misconfigured where the store was, uh, where the image was stored in the file system. So, be careful what kind of strategy you apply here and 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 try to it is like when it comes to debugging this review system there's there's a lot of guessing there's a lot of hypotheses that you come up with when when you're pulled into the the issue now you you read the logs you read the configuration files you you read the you know the different cases and and, and stuff like that and you try to come up with different hypotheses that you want to uh, go through so there's a lot of guessing here but there's a lot of intuition as well so if Based on your experience and stuff, you you should figure out if you want to just try to take a look at the entire system before you go uh, into specific nodes, or whether you want to start from a specific node and just go up. Or you can do what I prefer to do, which is just monkey debugging everything. It's like you you get a log and then you start looking in one node, and then you say, well, it's probably uh, you know the entire system's full, and then you look at the architecture, and then you're well, this looks good to me, and then you go and debug another node, and then you you know like. It's it's quite of a mess, but if you assume that you're in a low context environment, you can actually uh, you know uh, keep track of everything and make sure that other people know what's going on there. But again, like this, when when you go and do monkey debugging of your system, uh, it is because you have good hypotheses, you have experience, you know the system, and you you feel free to uh, let your intuition guide you basically throughout the process. Um, correlate your logs. If you have a distributed system, or even if you don't have, but if you have a distributed system, uh, I, I really, really hope that you have good logging um, and, and that all the parts of your system are configured in a way that uh, they will log enough information for you to figure out what's going on. I'm not saying they should all run in debug mode, um, but definitely like even info mode should have enough information for you to, to know what's going on um, or most of the time. So. Correlating your logs is actually useful to so bring, uh, like in OpenStack's case, uh, most of the services are broken down into several different services. So the, 
the services responsible for booting your virtual machines, it, is, it has an API node, it has a scheduler that will schedule the virtual machine into a specific compute node. So you can have like five different compute nodes, three different schedulers, and 10 different API nodes all working together. So when it comes to debugging these issues, it's actually super useful to just get the logs from every node and just correlate them and have all the events being put in order so that you know what's going on and, and how things happened. Um, it'll just give you one screen to look at instead of 10,000 different log files to go through. Um, trace events throughout the system. You should have a way to trace your events throughout the system. If you don't have it, implement it. It's super important. And especially when your, uh, your services are broken down into smaller services, like in, in, in OpenStack case, you have all these API nodes for, uh, for Nova and then the scheduler nodes for Nova and then the compute nodes for Nova. And and not being able to trace an event throughout the entire system would be super painful. So when we have issues, we just get you know the request request ID and timestamp and all that, and we'll just like basically grab the hell out of the logs, and we'll get uh, all the events. Uh, we'll basically be able to trace the event from the API node to the compute node entirely, which is super useful because that will give us information on where the request fail. Um, so the, if the request goes from the API node to the scheduler node and never gets to the compute node, that's good information. We were not gonna waste time debugging the compute nodes, we're just gonna stop in the scheduler node because something happened there and the request never left. Timestamps are pretty much your life. If you don't have timestamps, you should also have timestamps. Whatever kind of you know time you wanna have there. I don't care if it is ISO or timestamps or whatever, that's not my problem. Uh, but you should, have, you should be able to set a time, a point in time to every event that happened in your system. That'll most, mostly not, not really because you want to know exactly when it happened, but because you'll use the timestamp to assort all your events and all the things that happened in order so that you can go through it um, and in a much other way, I guess. And it'll make your life simpler. Order is important. Order, event times, events, and order in these various systems is super important. If you don't trust me, hmm. um, I'll leave it there. Uh, compare executions. Uh, it's also super useful. Even if you're able to walk everyone, everyone through uh, executions in your system and you know how things should work uh, by memory, you should, uh, you should try to uh, compare executions. Um, take different, like, one thing's happened to us once, and it was that we had this, uh, this customer case, and and they were saying like, uh, sometimes the system just like, Robin and Q again. Uh, it, it, Robin and Q basically it just runs out of memory and we have to restore it and we have to, you know, shut it down and bring it up, bring it back up. And we're like, well, you know, like, let's try to compare the things that are happening when, it, when they are happening. There's like, we comparing executions of single events didn't bring much information uh, until we started comparing the executions of the load, of, um, basically testing. We had a set of you know thousands of I don't know, n number of huge number of, of requests going on at the same time, and we figured out that uh, these failures happened every 15 minutes. And then we talked to the customer and said like, well, is there something that is happening actually every 15 minutes in your system? And they were like, well, yeah, we have this script that collects information from the system every 15 minutes. And I was like, oh well, you should have told that. And um, and the script, like, there was nothing wrong with the script actually. It was, it was, uh, it was an issue in, in OpenStack, but turns out the, the, the script was trying to collect information about the whole OpenStack environment and how many nodes were running and all that. And, and there wasn't like, the messaging system, the messaging library was leaking sockets at some point. And, and we, we, that, that just comparing the executions gave us enough information that was something going on with the load of, of the system at that specific point, and that basically give, gave us information of where we should look at. So comparing executions is actually useful. And having visualization tools are, um, uh, is, is actually good as well. There's nothing wrong with uh, having tools that will put in a nice way and a nice UI uh, your entire system. Um, there's nothing wrong if you cannot remember the entire topology in your head, um, still trying to be that hacker. Um, it is good to use visualization tools. It is good to have a way to just visualize uh, your system topology, uh, your events and things, because that will make it easier. You know, you just look at things. You don't have to read everything every time. If you have tools that can do that for you, it is, it is, it is great. And monitoring tools are not really um, the answer to this, actually, because they, they're not, monitoring tools will tell you how your system is doing right now. But when it comes to debugging actual failures, 
they normally don't give, give you enough information about, about what was what happened, like normally. Or if you're trying to debug the network, they won't give you, uh, monitoring tools won't give you information uh, about what's going on with your packets and, and where they dropped or something like that. So you need more specialized tools. Uh, and, and if you don't have them, it's good for you to spend some time either finding them or developing them. And I have like almost no time, so I'm gonna run through it. Um, so some bugs uh, just take longer to find. Uh, it is fine if you don't find them in a single day. Some bugs just take weeks. Uh, and and it's, so back in March, I was back in Venezuela for a while, and, 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 and we had an issue with uh, some of the customers. And not only the issue was hard to find and, and, and debug, but I also didn't have enough bandwidth to actually uh, work on it, <laughs> and 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 it just made it just made it you know way longer to to find, and and it is fine you know like if you try to rush the debug session, if you try to rush it, you'll probably just find the wrong issue, and then you'll hit it again, and and you're probably not gonna find anything. So it's good to. Again, it's good to find a workaround, and that's what we did in that case. We found a workaround that would bring the system back up for the customers, and then we took more than one week to actually find the real issue that we then, you know, like uh, back for it to the customer's uh, environment and and bring it uh, up to date. Um, describe the real problem. Sometimes, most of the times, actually, the real problem is that you just fucked it up, and that's fine. Uh, it uh, just make sure you can describe the problem, though. That's important bit here. If you're not able to describe what was going on in your system, you probably didn't find the actual issue. Uh, it is not like, uh, I have no idea, it just, you know, it is, it, it's back to working now, no. If you are debugging, if you're trying to find what's going on in your system, you should be able to describe it at the end because you should be able to explain it to other peers in your team so that whenever it happens again, uh, they'll, they'll have some extra bit of information. Build new, tool, new tools for future cases. Um, like if you don't have a tool to correlate your logs, sometimes logs are very specific to cost to, to every environment. So if you don't have tools to correlate those logs, spend a huge deal of time doing that because that will save you a lot of time when it comes to debugging systems. Uh, spend time building tools to visualize, visualize what's going on in your system. Spend time building tools that will allow you to correlate logs. Spend time building tools that will just collect logs. We have tools that will just collect logs from every node and pull them down in a single server. And that allows us to just go there in offline mode and debug whatever is going on, just go through the logs and see and try to figure out what's going on, even configuration files. Like we basically collect everything from our customers and, and, and that basically the, requires, uh, gives us information to just debug everything without having to poke the customer every time. Build a knowledge base if you don't have one. It is super useful. Put it in a search engine or whatever so that your, uh, the rest of your team can just go to that search engine and try to find issues that had happened before. And I guess that's it. So in summary, um, have clear goals, no system topology, um, keep a low context environment as much as you can, don't assume anything, keep the time small and contextualize, build new de debugging tools, have a checklist, check configurations files too, and I uh, don't know what to put in ninth, and seriously no clue what to put in tenth one. Uh, and references. Uh, I put the links there. I'm gonna publish these slides uh, after the talk. And, but it's basically some presentations, this previous season, and the programming APA is from Paul uh, Hale, I think. Uh, the Edo Principle, as I was, I've turned out to be an amazing book to read. Uh, so I'll recommend that, and Blood and Tears. Lots of tears, <laughs> mostly blood. And that's it. Thanks a lot for staying there and being awake, and if you have questions, I'm here. There's time for questions, of course, which I don't think we have. But no questions. I don't see hands, so you you'll have to speak up if you have questions because I have the lights in my head. Say that again. Sure. There you go. I question. I think I have. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, do you do you have a guideline for how long you should try to debug something on a? production system before you just sort of cut bait and restart or restart the node or restart the service. Do you have any general guidelines around, like, in your experience, is it 
how, how long uh, do you spend debugging before a manager or whomever decides, oh, well, we spent enough time trying to figure this out. We just need to get this going again. Uh, and unless in my case, it really depends on the customer, you know, like, it, 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 well, not really the customer, the environment. Uh, you know, how critical is the environment? Is, is, your, is your actual production environment, is, like, is, is your system entirely down? If your system is entirely down, it'll just, like, just restart it, man. Uh, just bring it back up. We don't want you to have you know, down times. And they'll just collect the logs and, and try to debug it offline. If we can't, then we'll have to, you know, like go through some of the town times and wait for it to happen again and, and try to figure out, well, uh, what is it's happening, basically. Okay. But it really depends on how critical the environment is. Like not all production environments are that critical. We have several customers that use, I don't know, like OpenStack internally. And sometimes when things happen, they'll like, just take your time, like, sure, like, try to make it quick and, and bring it back up as soon as you can, but uh, it is fine if, if it is not back up tomorrow, for instance. Uh, whereas there are some other environments where you just like, ah, I don't, I can't have downtimes, like, bring it up, and then, then we'll, okay, restart it, I guess. That's, that's the quickest. 